You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash Oro, and this is episode 82, Being an Adventurous Entrepreneur, Bali Edition. Let's go. Welcome back, Liberty Nation. Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash Oro, and today's guest is Derek Loudermilk. He is the host of the Art of Adventure Podcast. He is a high-performance coach and the author of the forthcoming book, Superconductors, which promotes the idea of skill stacking, how to acquire a set of skills that makes you more rare, valuable, and irreplaceable in the marketplace. Derek, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Ash, it's a pleasure to be here. So fill in the gaps here. Who are you and what are you passionate about? I like to call myself a professional adventurer. And I've, I've been traveling for the last four years. I think you and I have actually wound up in some of the same places um, I was traveling solo and now I'm traveling with a family and wherever we go, countries around the world, I like to both go on adventures, find some wilderness area to explore, but I'm also talking to entrepreneurs in each country that I go to and I'm learning from uh, people at co-working spaces, but also local entrepreneurs, people that own fruit stands and tour guide companies and things like that. So I'm really trying to get a pulse of the state of entrepreneurship in each place that I travel to and mixing that with going on adventures and spending plenty of time outdoors and in the wilderness. Yeah, so what is it about adventures specifically? And just what are adventures and why Why do you feel like this is drawn to you? And why? what does this have anything to do with entrepreneur? being an entrepreneur yeah so I've, I've come up with this definition of adventure there's there's three parts uh, one is that an adventure is called an interesting or remarkable experience in, in the in the dictionary which means to remark about something means you tell a story about it you leave an adventure with a story there's some element of risk to adventure. The word adventure comes from the French aventure, and Ooh. it's the same as venture, as in venture capital, in that there's some element of risk, whether it's real or perceived risk. So physical danger, or maybe it's just you feel like you're taking a risk socially or something like that. And the third is there's some element of change that happens to you as you complete an adventure, you come out of it as a new person. It leaves its mark on you that you bring to your following endeavors, that you bring to the rest of the world that you can share with your friends. So uh, an adventure may be, and the most common types are traveling to a distant place. It's easiest to have an adventure when you go to a new country, when you go to the wilderness, because you're physically changing so many things in your surroundings. But adventure can happen on a much smaller scale anytime you have those elements where you are taking a risk and you're going through something. And it it could be buying a house for the first time is some type of adventure or um, a relationship or there's any number of things that, that can fall into that adventure framework, including starting a business. Right. Hence the tie to entrepreneurism. Um, are, are you an adventurepreneur? Uh, I am actually. I love. I love to tie in adventure. the The podcast that I host is the Art of Adventure podcast, and I recently held a retreat for entrepreneurs called Adventure Quest. And one of the things we do is we actually go out on big adventures, like jumping off waterfalls or climbing giant volcanoes or surfing big waves. And we, there's lots of analogies like, oh, entrepreneurship is like climbing a mountain. Well, we went and climbed a mountain to see if it really was a good analogy for entrepreneurship. Yeah, I, I should say we're currently recording in Bali in Indonesia. And as you're talking about mountains, I can almost see a gong 
the vol- the active volcano oh, yeah. uh, that's just a couple miles from our house right Every now. Every morning, I look out my window and I say, I give a report to my family. I say, it's erupting today. Or, it's, <laughs> it's not erupting. <laughs> it did erupt like two nights ago. Yeah. Yeah. I a saw, little, little poof. Yeah, I saw the pictures. Um, but let's let's continue on with the, the mountain and hiking up the mountain uh, metaphor because I think it's really good. And I know that... so. You hold these adventure quests, which is part of your your business, where people from around the world, I assume part of your community, since you've written a book previously, you're currently writing Superconductors, your, your upcoming book, and you've had a podcast for how many episodes? We're about 2.30 in right wow, now. Wow, 2.30. Congrats. I think this is, uh, we're only in the 80s here, but... Um, what have you learned? Like when you bring these people from around the world, they basically by your service of let's mix, let's get a group of people from around the world together that may or probably don't know each other. And I'm going to take them on adventures that are going to challenge them how? So generally the way I structure it is a mix of physical challenges followed by business specific workshops where we have this nice villa and we do our workshops in the villa. And so we're, we're resting uh, physically on the days we're doing the workshops. But part of these physical challenges and part of any adventure is this question that people have of, do I have what it takes when the chips are down? And how, how will I be when I'm faced with some great challenge, when I'm faced with the peak moments of my life? Who will I be? In those moments and when you are thinking about repelling you know 100 feet off a cliff it's very confronting and you have to use courage you have to you have to practice courage but you also have to deal with all these things that come up for you like um, you know people are still worried about their physical safety even though it's theoretically a, a safe activity we've got protection in place and so there's all kinds of great analogies between climbing a mountain or going canyoning or rappelling to business in the sense that okay i'm i'm taking these people out to the canyon right so i'm a guide and in business it helps so much to have a guide and we hire even local guides who are more expert at the terrain right so you're you can translate that hiring specific people to help you with specific things like micro coaches in business right absolutely or just you know your council of wise elders Elders. that gives you the advice you need when you need it right there's also the the group aspect these adventure trips uh i have this motto that the wisdom is in the group like these are all high level entrepreneurs they all know a lot and they're still looking to up-level themselves. And it's not just me that's the coach or the leader of the adventure, but each person in turn will probably support the rest of the group throughout a week-long trip. And you know they all have different experience of business that they can add to each other. So partly it's about bringing together the right people, mm-hmm. which is <clears throat> my most important role is to just get the right coaches, the right activities, the right people in the right location and magic is going to happen. Right. And, you know, I'm really curious what you think happens to these entrepreneurs when you get them out into the wilderness, for instance. And, and, and I'd like part of this answer, I'd like for you to talk about your trip up that mountain, like literally hiking up and down that mountain. But what do you think it does for these entrepreneurs who oftentimes live up in their brains rather than down in their bodies? Oh my gosh. Yeah, this is such a theme. It's a great, great question because we are biological entities. We're large mammals. And we spend all this time thinking strategically, going through all different parts of business. It's often cerebral and our bodies have all kinds of knowledge that is untapped right intuition is such a powerful tool that successful silicon valley ceos are really learning to tap into 
And if we can access body knowledge and energy and motivation in addition to our cerebral, then it's a huge advantage. So just walking in the woods will put you back into your body because you're using your body. You're using your physical sensations and you're feeling the wind on your skin and all of these things. And it, it goes so far into getting you out of your head and reducing stress and all these things, but also improving the way you utilize the discussion between your brain and your body. It also really helps in the communication between two people because so much of our communication up to 93% is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of benefits just to, to moving your body and getting in touch with that. Yeah. And what do you think it does for the brain to be able to not shut off, but almost like delegate some of that decision-making to other parts of the body? Because I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm guilty of this. I, don't move my body nearly as much as I say that I want to. And I stay up in my brain a lot. And and that's because I've had a lot of success being up in my brain. You know, I've built mm -hmm. successful businesses. I've made money and it has been a safety zone for me to protect what I think is myself. What do you think it does for the people that join your adventure quest and get challenged, not in the regular entrepreneurial sense, like, oh, I've got to set up this PayPal and I got to set up this bank account and then I need to connect it to my website and then I need to make sure I'm following my click-through rates and check on my Google Analytics and all the, my email marketing list and all these things that in, entrepreneurs you know they need to do. But what does it do for them whenever they come on an adventure quest where maybe they're not using their brain even half as much as what they would typically yeah, and so have you ever had a good idea when you're in the shower, or some epiphany moment? Mm. The the common like I have a great idea in the shower is it comes from because your physical body is occupied with a sort of routine movement, and that lizard brain part of you is is busy, you know, scrubbing the soap around, and so you have a more direct connection to your cerebral cortex and you can actually access your good ideas better so some of my best ideas and, and throughout history like people like einstein have come up with their best ideas while walking right because it increases blood flow to the brain and it occupies the physical body so it's a it's a great creative resource mm -hmm. uh first of all so so physically moving um but it also spurs people to action climbing a volcano uh and being in the present you're you know climbing over a set of roots or you're dealing with whatever and it forces you into the present it forces you out of the past it forces you out of like wondering what is going to go wrong in the future and it forces you to deal with the solutions that are right in front of you getting around this obstacle, sliding down this muddy slope, you know, dealing with my heavy breathing, whatever it is, and it forces you into the present and into a solution-oriented mindset, which all of that, getting into action, produces results, but it also builds your confidence because you can see the direct result of your actions. Right, yeah, and I love that term that you keep using, action. I mean... One of the main reasons, if not the sole reason that I created Liberty Entrepreneurs is because I was, I was tired of the, just the idea of thinking about freedom. And I was tired of all the libertarian theory and the anarchist theory and like all these ways that things could be. And when I look back on my life, the thing that was most important was the actions I took, you know, it, and it seems very common to what you're saying about not only being an entrepreneur and taking action, but being an adventure and taking action. When did this idea of the adventure mindset come to you? And, and when did you start to realize that it was so closely aligned to the entrepreneurial mindset? Yeah. So, so it's, it's really interesting. We are wired to be happier 
when we are adventuring, when we're solving problems, when we're you know, creating new businesses, imagine a, an ancient tribe of people and they sort of utilize all of the resources in their valley and they sort of expand their population to the point where they're getting low on food and it's up to a few adventurers to go over the mountain range and explore to find the next fertile valley to expand in. So our evolution has wired us to seek solutions to to give us a surge of dopamine, which is a happiness chemical, when we're solving problems. And when we're out adventuring, there's any number of random problems. And when we're creating new businesses, it's the same dopamine surge that, that we're getting. And so the adventure mindset of taking action, of trying things, of testing things out, and, and failure is a big part of adventure. Like there's a lot of things that don't work out, but you keep persisting in adventure until you get to your destination. You keep persisting in business, trying things, and, and it's an enjoyable process. Like, let's see if this works. Right. And it's like that curious nature. Yeah. It, it's like, okay, what can I do? How, what can I accomplish? What can I build? Do you think that's intrinsic to humanity, or do you think that this is a learned behavior? I think it's intrinsic to humanity, but it's something that our socializing our culture dampens down i think people it's natural to worry about if we take a risk what will people think of us will we lose our social standing social support is is important right it's it's uh it provides us some safety so if we we feel like if we get on stage and we bomb singing karaoke we Which might, I always do. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I might I might lose all my friends and I'll be a social outcast. Right? Yeah. Like that's like the logical extreme. So I'm just like, no, thank you. And this was me for years. I didn't sing I wanted to sing karaoke, but it took me like ten years to get up the courage. I only sing Garth Brooks. I've got friends in low places, yeah. But I, I hear you, I don't want to sing. And so we want to take these risks, but there's all kinds of like quote unquote good reasons to not take these risks but that a lot of times these risks are perceived and not real and the like the positive upside of of trying something is much greater than the perceived risk of failure mm. yeah and i love it because the adventure mindset is the entrepreneurial mindset because a lot of times entrepreneurs find their niche or their opening in the marketplace by seeing something that other people either haven't done before mm -hmm. or seeing something that other people have done but they know they can do a better job like that's why i started liberty virtual assistance is because i saw what was happening in the marketplace and i knew that i could do a better job and it is adventuring it's adventuring into the unknown i mean as my audience knows, I don't claim to be this like super entrepreneur. I'm not Elon Musk, you know, hardly. I'm a tenth of one billionth of one percent of what this guy has built. But it's like having that adventure mindset to go out and just be curious about what I can do and know that it's going to be risky, but know that, you know, as long as you're able to take action, that at least when you take action, you're going to have more information to take better action later on. Right. And and for you, like you had this insight, like I think I can create this, and I think it'll be useful. And a lot of people wouldn't trust that insight. Like, who am I to decide to create this business? This whole, uh, you know, even CEOs deal with imposter syndrome. You know, how do I know enough to be the one in charge here? And and it's this confidence that you build through a variety of different challenges that like I know that I'm going to be able to deal with people well I know I'm going to be able to learn things I know I'm going to be able to manage this in the future even though I don't know what's going to be created so I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot and create this business this uh, VA business or whatever it is uh, 
so many people take themselves out of the game because they don't have the confidence because they haven't put themselves in enough situations to purposely build right their confidence to use courage enough so i think it's story time story time story time and Whenever you came back, so again, Derek is is currently my neighbor here in, in Bali, in Ubud, Bali. Once your adventure quest, your most recent adventure quest was done, you came back and you were telling me about this hike up this mountain, and I'm sure you'll know the name of it, but you said that you were actually surprised that everyone made it up and made it down. And and I'm, I'm really curious why that was, and if anyone before you started the hike if anyone was talking about the poten- the possibility of failing to make it to the top because i know it was an easy hike there's yeah, yeah, no yeah. walk in the park so it took us 10 hours six hours up four hours down it's uh it's a second large volcano in bali and it's you go through four different ecosystems as you go up four different types of forest rainforest cloud forest moist forest uh and then sort of like pine forest at the very top um and people were coming up with like, oh, you know, I have this old knee injury, like I might not make it or whatever. So like everyone had their built-in excuses, they're out if they had to turn around. But I knew that everyone wanted to finish the summit and make mm-hmm. it back. And, you know, in the first couple hours, everyone's full of energy and chatting it up, chatting it up and all these things, right? And then it's like the, the volcano gets steeper and steeper and it gets hard. And then people move into their own like they're pushing their physical limits. They're breathing hard. These It's steeper than a set of stairs for hours. Mm-hmm. There's slippery roots. There's leeches. There's all kinds of things. And, you know, I, I actually didn't realize it was going to take us so long. I was like, <laughs> we're, you know, we're fit. We're great. It'll only take us like six hours. Um, so my own expect it was harder than my own expectations and you know this this ebb and flow like seeing people hit the end of their limit and be like i don't think i can make it like where's the top give me some palm sugar so i can get a burst of energy okay the top is still an hour and a half away like wow what do i do knowing that i really just want to stop but i'm motivated to keep pushing Mm. and i saw people do things like start supporting other people because they didn't want to think about themselves. So they became cheerleaders for other people. Or I noticed when someone was hiking in front for a while, they got so much energy from leading and from being like, they saw themselves as an inspiration. Like here they are hiking strongly at the front of the pack. So that gave them energy, their own self image. And on the way down, like we're slipping and sliding over these muddy obstacles and people were really enjoying the chance to get muddy and dirty and giving themselves permission to get through this no matter what it looked like right how pretty it was women that normally like to be fashionable and their fingernails painted and yeah and so there's so many different components to an adventure like this that uh we can reflect on afterwards and say like, wow, uh, I made it through this whole full day long adventure and I did what I needed to in different moments when I was struggling or when I was feeling good. Physically, I was tired, but mentally I was strong. And once you have accomplished something like this, it's a really big thing that you can say, I've done this. Mm. And uh, your next big business challenge is so much easier for you when you can say, I've climbed a freaking you know, volcano, yeah. meter volcano that took me all day. This is nothing. Pitching a $10,000 contract is, is nothing. Uh, you know, standing in front of a room of billionaires, it's no big deal. Yeah, so, so Derek is an American, and when he says 9,000 meters, he probably means 9,000 feet. Oh, 9,000 feet, 3,000 meters. <laughs> he, yes. tr- he tries to get Sorry. fancy with these international uh, numbers here. but um, So l- let's transition a bit, and what is a superconductor? Why write the book, and how did you get the idea? Okay, several questions. So a uh, superconductor is someone who 
mobilizes people and ideas and leverages their their networks and their creativity and their skills to make big things happen. So it's it's someone who can control and access all the tools that are available to them to really go above and beyond in creating powerful movements or powerful ideas or creating businesses that are sort of the next level. And so a superconductor is someone who is like an orchestral conductor, someone who controls lots of moving pieces to bring them together to accomplish a very complex task. And I, I wrote this book because I started noticing in my interviews with guests on The Art of Adventure that certain themes kept coming up, certain very useful qualities kept appearing in these interviews. And so I, I did a, an assessment of what are these common themes, these common skills that are so important for these successful people. And they include things like strategic relationships, being able to tell good stories, either in person or in your marketing material, being able to come up with really good ideas and then act on those good ideas. And there's, there's all these themes. And so I decided to look at all the interviews I had done and all the books that I had read and come up with the most important skills that basically make you more valuable in the marketplace mm -hmm. that can add on top of your existing technical skills as a, as a programmer or a marketer or as a writer, whatever, whatever it is your basic competence is, you can add these skills on top. And all of a sudden, you're the only person in the world with this particular mix mm. of valuable skills, which then allows you to really control the trajectory of your career. It allows you to choose the projects that you really want to do. It allows you to affect the most people and it allows you to be compensated really well and feel fulfilled in your career, which is the whole point of working after all. It's just mm. something you like to enjoy. Yeah, it, it sounds very in common with the idea of being a polymath. And I know we have our our pal here, uh, Patricia Parkinson, in the room, eavesdropping on this presentation. Um, she is one of the foremost leaders in the ideas of polymath and founder of Blockchain Babes. But is this like collection of stacking skill sets on top of each other, purposefully stacking skill, skill sets on top of each other, like a, a polymath tendency? And would you consider yourself a polymath? And if so, what is a polymath in your idea? Uh, well, thanks to Trish, I, I do consider myself to be a polymath. Uh, I have specifically, I have a very broad interest but I like to go deep in a certain number of those fields. So I have been a professional cyclist. I have discovered a new species as a scientist. I'm an entrepreneur and adventurer. So these are some of the areas that I've like really gone deep and I'm probably in the top 5% in the world in these specific skills, but there's other skills that like, I'm just interested in learning, right? This forms my like broadness mm. and I'll read in any topic. And a polymath has has an advantage in that they can see the intersection among different fields that they have gone deep in, and that is where the cutting edge lies. This is where new ideas, new businesses, new solutions to problems often are found is when you mash up, let's say, adventure and entrepreneurship or geopolitics and investing and you start to see things that other people who don't have such a broad and deep range of skills it's just not going to be available to them like their brain uh whatever your brain is exposed to is sort of like where your thought patterns exist hmm. and so when you have this broad and deep series of inputs things that you've learned all of a sudden you start making natural connections which you may be the only person in the world and it may seem very obvious to you right like, oh, of course, you know, 
we're going to do whatever with the blockchain. Right. Yeah. The, the intersection of engineering, economics, and entrepreneurship, of yeah. course, duh, uh, that's every day. But to most people, that is a perspective that they have almost no ability to comprehend. But to me, it's like every day. Yeah. And that's so cool when you get to that point and because it, it feels natural. Right. And people are like, again, this imposter syndrome comes in like, 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 I can't believe this is so obvious to me Yeah, that no one's come up with it, but new knowledge is created every day. New businesses are created every day. We're constantly expanding all kinds of things. And you might be the person, the person listening or Ash, you might be the one person like right at the cutting edge. Right. Which is so exciting, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and, and how do you think this mindset, this both polymath but adventurer mindset builds that confidence to overcome that imposter syndrome? When, when you're forced to complete something, when you're forced to get through climbing a volcano, uh, or when you're forced to use your courage for piling down a volcano or in, in business, you know that you need to earn some money and you're forced to sort of cold call someone and pitch them. Uh, all of these things, right, like take some courage to actually do. They take a little bit of willpower, a little bit of courage. And, you know, once you do them, you're like, okay, cool. I... I did that. I think I can do that again. Um, it, it really helps when you have like a good sense of who you're doing this for. If you know your your customer, or I, you know, I want to create this business to help so and so, and I really connect with a single person that I'm practicing courage for. Maybe it's maybe it's my family. I need to I need to earn money so that I can provide for my family, and I'm practicing courage for them. So that really helps. But once you build this backlog of things that you've done that have mm. required courage, then you end up getting pretty convinced of your ability to succeed in the next unknown right. situation. Right. You, you are confident that you can relate well to people. You're confident that you can be creative and find a few different solutions and then pick the one that works. You're confident that even if you're sweating and fearful that you'll still step onto that stage and deliver the talk. And it's this, it's this foundational belief in yourself that's so important because if you don't have this, you probably won't take action. You probably won't take risks. And the only way to get results is by doing something. Mm -hmm. If you don't start, you can't finish. Like if no one started this volcano, they couldn't have climbed it. Right. So and the, sitting around thinking about climbing the volcano is not going to give you near the confidence in actually acting and climbing the volcano. Yeah. And it's so funny. Like everyone was like, I'm so glad I did this and I will never do it again. Yeah. It was so hard, but I'm so glad I did it. Right. It's like, I will never try to set up an offshore bank account again. Because it is so hard, but I'm glad that I did it. So, who are some, you know, as this, and I haven't met someone like you before, especially someone who may do all of his podcasts without a shirt on. I'm not sure. But, but definitely this podcast. But who are some of, like, your superheroes? Or, or who, like, or people that you would role model yourself after or e even like fictional movie stars or, or real people. I, I don't know. Like who who have you taken, you know, influence and inspiration from? Yeah, and we were actually talking about this a little bit before the recording. Uh, <laughs> thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a good conversation. Needs to it needs to be on air. So I I <laughs> came up with this idea that. You know, we have our sports heroes, we have the movie characters that we love or the, the characters in the novels that we really identify with. And I was thinking, like, well, why do we identify with these people? Why do we love yeah. these heroes? And it's because we see a reflection of ourselves in them. We see 
either something we already have this this little bit of their spark in us or something that we aspire to and so for me uh when i was thinking like who are my heroes like indiana jones comes to mind the scientist the nobel winning scientist richard Feynman comes to mind uh jim carrey comes to mind and for example indiana jones is the type of person who he's very charismatic and he's like leap into action i'm going to try to like defeat the enemy even even if i don't have a plan at the moment i'm going to start right richard Feynman was so curious mm. he was willing to you know work on a, a physics problem because he was tossing plates in the air and he won a nobel prize because of it but he also went and played the bongos at carnival in brazil or he studied the ants moving around his apartment mm -hmm. and he was willing to go deeper and deeper into something and then jim carrey he's so physically expressive you know he's like so using his body but he's aware of his own evolution as an artist as a comedian as a as an <clears throat> actor and so i'm identifying each of these things in the heroes and i'm seeing in myself what I value what I like to cultivate and our heroes you know they they really just provide this great reflection for who we'd like to become or the things that we want in ourselves and what do you think are some of the base or most fundamental characteristics that makes a good adventurer and or entrepreneur mm, that's a good question I think we have this balance between us of ease and comfort and complacency and like I'm satisfied with my life where it is which is is somewhat of an obstacle to overcome and a lot of people fall into their routines and they go through life and they realize like wow uh, I was, I was quite happy with, with my routine and I ended up at the end of my life, but I have a few regrets that I didn't take that trip abroad or that I didn't, I had a brilliant business idea. I did have that insight right. and I knew it would work, right. but I didn't start it. Mm. And the difference between an adventurer is, is their curiosity over what they might be able to achieve and wondering, you know, at the end of their life, if they, if they're going to have regrets, they want to eliminate that. Mm -hmm. They want to actually see what's possible for them. And that is enough to pull them into action versus someone who would be content with letting the world dictate for them the path of their life. So an adventurer is someone who decides actively, they use this gift from God, right? The ability to make a decision about should I go this way or that way with their life? That's the true nature of an adventurer. Mm, that, that free will type of being okay with the unknown, know it's going to be risky and embracing the discomfort. Absolutely. Mm. Yes. So this, discomfort, being comfortable with the uncomfortable, being comfortable, being a beginner, right? being uncomfortable with the unknown and going inward. Mm. So how have you found being an adventurepreneur has created freedom in your own personal life? And what doors has it opened? I think for me, a large part of freedom is how I choose to spend my time. Time is such a limited resource and now I'm a father and I have a family and I love being able to decide when I'm going to pour a lot of energy into developing a business or pour a lot of energy into spending time in cultivating the relationship with my son or my partner Heidi and Freedom and adventure to me is really 
having the ability and control to choose how we spend the moments. If I'd like to earn some more money, then I want to be able to choose to do that. And I also want to be able to choose to spend time with my friends recording this podcast. Oh, you thanks, know, man. With, with Ash. My buddy Ash. Uncle Ash. Uncle Ash. Uncle Ash. <laughs> that, that, that's because uh, Derek's son, Axel, calls me uncle. So just for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's... I'll say that of all the podcasts that I've done, this one has felt the most, if I may, Tim Ferriss esque. Mm. Because I feel like this is, has been this has been a very real and at times emotional podcast where it's I mean, a lot of my podcasts are about people offering their story, but for me for some reason this one has been about action specifically and and not only action of the mind but action of the body and it's something that i struggle with you know Mm. at times action of the body because i'm so comfortable in the mind and it's done me so well and what type of advice would you have for fellow entrepreneurs who are so comfortable and successful building from the mind Mm. and they haven't become okay with the discomfort of dropping down out of it and into the body. Yeah. So there's, there's a really lovely practice which can increase your presence. And if you think of the Dalai Lama or Bill Clinton or people like that, they are right there with you and it amplifies their power their ability to influence and get things done is how present they are and how in their body they are so it's actually very powerful to drop into your body and so something very simple that you can do is we've heard take a deep breath that's a that's a good step one then feeling your toes Feeling Mm. your clothes sitting on your skin. Just reminding yourself that you have a physical, biological body that you're inhabiting. Mm -hmm. Like your brain lives in this biological meat sack. Just one part of it. Yeah. (laughs) And that can really just quickly drop you in to being present. But also utilizing your senses. Like what sounds are happening around me right now? If I close my eyes for one minute Mm -hmm. and listen... All of a sudden, I'm right here in my physical body in the present. And then being present in that activity is so useful in a conversation. It's so useful in focusing in your brainstorming activities. It's so so useful in executing on an idea that you have. And so, yeah, just using some simple ways to bring yourself back into your body is such a powerful lever for amplifying your mind. Mm. I love the the concept of can you feel your fingers or can you feel your toes, right? Because I've often found myself whenever I'm really in my head, my hands and my toes go cold. Mm. And so that's my signal that I can't feel them because they're so cold that I've, I've pulled all of the energy out of them and like pushed it into my brain because that's where I'm purposefully trying to use that energy for my own benefit of some sort, but they'll, they'll turn very cold. So that, that really stuck out to me is when you're really in your head and you're working really hard and you're frustrated with that PayPal invoice that doesn't get paid, like, (laughs) can you feel your toes? Can you feel your fingers? Yeah. I, I really love that. Um, Derek, well, this has been a wonderful interview. I've really appreciated this. And I hope my audience doesn't hang me for saying that this is, in my opinion, a Tim Ferriss-esque interview. Uh, Mm -hmm. Doing these in-person interviews, I don't get to do them very often, but I can see myself like now doing what Tim does, flying around and interviewing people in person because it's so much more personal yeah. whenever you get to again, talk to somebody. Again, we can see what each other, our body language, we can, For sure. we can read each other. Absolutely. And the whole point of this 
is we're two people. Yeah. We're connecting. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, you are an absolute liberty entrepreneur. I, I, I really commend you for helping our brethren entrepreneurs, both male and female, come and explore and experience and challenge themselves in the physical sense along with their mental sense because you know I, I think it creates such a more well-rounded type of person that can go on more adventures face more challenges and and learn from productive discomfort that they find themselves in rather than feeling like that imposter or fraud that i know we all suffer with uh, Derek, if anyone from my audience would like to contact you or keep up with you, how can they reach you? Yeah, the, thank you. The, the best place is DerekLoudermilk.com or at DerekLoudermilk on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, those are the best places. And, and how about um, your podcast? What's the name of it again? And how can people listen to it and yeah, subscribe? Yeah, the podcast is The Art of Adventure on iTunes or wherever you Get your podcast. YouTube, all the normal sources. So Derek Loudermilk, The Art of Adventure. Check out his new book, Superconductors, for anyone listening. And if you're interested, thank you again, Derek, for coming on the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. Until next time, keep building freedom. That's it.